tripod. So, Malcolm, um, great to have you here at the Wharton People Analytics Conference. Thank you. I noticed you have less hair than last time you came. Was that deliberate? Um, I have, uh, well, I was talking about relative to you or relative to my, <laughs> previ my previous, relative to my previous hair state, yes. Okay, uh, I'll have some data questions about that later, but you just told us that we should be thinking about slowing down standardized tests, like the LSAT or the MCAT or the GRE or any of them. Or if we don't, we should at least explain why we're not slowing them down. And okay. give me, a, give me a, a reason why you want to speed a power test before speeding a power test. I have some reasons. Do you want to hear them? Yes. Okay, disclaimer first, though. One of the things I love most about your work is how you push all of us to question our own assumptions. And so I feel that the most respectful way to have a conversation with you is to challenge your assumptions. Okay. Are we good with that? Yes. Okay. So with that in mind, uh, first of all, the reason that I want the standardized test to be short, whether I'm looking at students or job applicants, is because we already have long power tests. They're called grades. And so if a student gets to spend four years accumulating those grades, why in the world now do we need yet another tortoise contest? Uh, well, there's an additional reason. So we have uh, LSATs and uh, SATs and GREs are not uh, knowledge tests, classically speaking. They're cognitive evaluations, right? So we're trying to get at something that is different from grades even if we unspeed them. So in that sense, I, I guess what I'm interested in, as a pure cognitive evaluation, why are we biasing in, in favor of the hair? Um, I'm interested in the kind of, of, of measuring the kind of pure cognitive strength that, uh, um, that, uh, uh, that shows its face under pure power conditions. Okay. Particularly for pure power professions. Cool, I like that. However, in psychology, we have this distinction between typical and maximum performance. Typical performance is basically how well do you do on your usual day. Maximum is how good are you at your best. And those two measures tend to correlate pretty highly. So that the higher your maximum performance, also the higher your typical performance. Which leads me to think that although there might be some really, really brilliant tortoises um, and also some less brilliant hares, um, that most of the time the two go hand in hand and that processing speed is also a proxy for you know, the complexity of information you can handle. So if that's the case, do we really need to tease the two apart for the rare people who fall in one of the off-diagonals? I was surprised when I started, you, uh, as I uh, pointed out in my talk, you know 10 times more than this than I do, but I was surprised when I was reading up on this recently, the extent to which psychometricians insist that speed and power are separate quantities. Um, now, it is additionally the case that uh, you don't, uh, when you move from a, my understanding is when you move from a speed of power test to a pure power test, you don't necessarily change the shape of the curve, but you do jumble um, the, the rankings of people on the curve, and it's that jumbling that interests me. So maybe the jumbling, if you look at, for example, on the chess, if you compare classic versus splits chess rankings top 20 players in the world. Uh, there isn't a huge amount of difference, but there are these cases, so in, of those 20 players, there's maybe four who have dramatically different um, classic rankings as blitz rankings. Darren Ling being one of them, Wesley So being another. And then there's weird cases like uh, Magnus Carlsen, the greatest player in the world, who is marginally the best at classic chess, and so far and away, the more you speed it up, the more he becomes dominant. So there's two things going on here. One is that when I arbitrarily add in a speed component, I, I start to lose at the margins. I may have a general sense of what's going on, but I'm missing people. And I'm obsessed with missing people. And the second thing is it obscures my understanding of what makes someone good. So you learn a lot about Magnus Carlsen when you look at his performance under different speedy conditions. You understand what is brilliant about him as a chess player is that he doesn't make mistakes even when, you, when the game is going like that, right? That's a really interesting observation about him. Yeah, it is. And so I, I can see the rationale for that. I guess it just seems like in most complex jobs, it's not quite as independent, right? So like in, in your old running days, uh, the fastest sprinter is never going to be the best marathoner or vice versa. 
Um, but I think in general, the more expert somebody is at a job, um, I read something once about 10,000 hours, which we'll talk about too. And you know, the more, the more expert you are, right, the less you have to rely on sort of slow system two thinking, the more that your fast, intuitive, visceral heuristics are accurate, um, which I also read about in another book um, that you might have blinked at once or twice. And with all that in mind, shouldn't we just assume most of the time that the experts are going to be the, well, but, the fastest? Adam, but, but hold on. I chose the legal profession for a reason. You did. And I chose it for a reason because I think this is one example where that, um, that relationship between speed and performance starts to break down. Yep. I absolutely do not want a speed reading lawyer. So the, the kind of person who, when I, would, and I played that Sheila... Kohatkar uh, clip for a reason as well. That mindset of, there is a woman who is incapable of being fast. So she has a, she has a personality constraint on speeding up. She can't sleep at night, she worries, she can only be dogged and thorough. In her chosen profession of being uh, uh, an investigative reporter, that is absolutely central. You cannot be a speed reading investigative reporter, right? And work. But if you're someone who doesn't want to go back the fifth time, you're never going to get that kind of story. So there are specific moments, in other words, when we have to understand that the cognitive um, um, uh, uh, profile of the profession is different. Um, my father was a mathematician. There's no upside for him being fast. He might publish, uh, a great mathematician might publish you know, 10 great papers in their lifetime. Why does it matter whether they, why would we want to reward a mathematician who wrote his paper in six months as opposed to two years? Right? I think you answered your own question in an article you wrote a while ago, uh, which, which actually said that the more output you produce, also the better your shot at stumbling onto greatness. Um, you actually said that the more bad ideas you have, yeah. the better you will be. And so don't we actually want to reward speed to get to quality? Not in a lawyer. Not in a lawyer. Right. So now, see, you're, 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 I know the game you're playing, and I appreciate it. <laughs> I'm but, trying to play a speed game. Come yeah, on. But you are, you are, you're not listening to me, Adam. <laughs> I'm being very specific about lawyers. The lawyer cannot, the lawyer, we do not want the high output, lots of error lawyer. I'm sorry, what were you saying? <laughs> no, just go on. We, I wasn't listening for real. But now I'm listening. <laughs> okay. okay, so why do we want lawyers Can you slow? imagine the lawyer who came to you and said, uh, so here's the contract, uh, take a look. If it turns out it's not the right thing, we, we can just go back and do another version later. Are you kidding me? That's a, that's a disaster. I'm reminded, you know, that, you know that story in the financial crisis where someone puts the comma in the wrong place and they end up paying, you know, what, I forgot, $20 a share for layman and not $2 a share? Who was the person who read that document at two in the morning? The hair. It wasn't Sheila Kohatkar. She would be the one who read it five times. Why? Because she'd be petrified that she put the comma in the wrong place. There are specific, you know, or the person who is uh, uh, in any kind of high stakes job where the penalty for error is high, you can't afford to have hairs. So it's, what I'm objecting to is the very thing that you're talking about, which is you're trying to make a general set of principles about selection. And I think you can't Make a general. I think you have to be much more specific in saying, um, and not only, by the way, there are parts of the law where I might want a hair. So what I want the legal profession to say is, for this kind of law, and this kind of law, and this kind of law, I want the neurotic tortoise. For this kind of law, I want the hair. And I want them to say, okay, so let's create a safe space for the neurotic tortoise, as opposed to penalizing them at the point of entry. I like that a lot for the tortoise. Where I wonder about it is, what are the consequences for the people around the tortoise and for the organization? And you, you may not care. Yeah. Um, and I think that's reasonable, right? To, to care more about making sure that people don't get missed than about like, whether a law firm does well. But I think that there, in systems dynamics terms, we can think about equifinality, right? Multiple paths to the same end. And being neurotic is one path to that, right? Like I, I can relate to that. I remember like being afraid when I was studying for tests that like, I would do so badly that I would not only fail, but my professors would take away points on my previous exams because there's no way I could have earned what I'd gotten before. And that anxiety was really motivating for those of us who are defensive pessimists. Yeah. Um, but it's only one route to that thoroughness, right? So you could be really emotionally stable and also incredibly conscientious. 
and you could be fast, and then you could have that motivation to want to double check and triple check and quadruple check. And so I guess I wonder, do we need, could it just be a really conscientious hare who's fast, who executes, and then is also careful on but the back like saying, That's like saying, can't we have all basketball players who resemble Michael Jordan? You know, you, you, yeah. we can't argue for the perfect form, because the perfect form happens once in a generation. I, I think that if you're going to, if you want um, highly conscientious, highly neurotic people, they're going to be tortoises, by and large. Um, I mean, remember as well that I'm not saying about removing all speed constraints. So on the breakdown of take-home test, exam, uh, um, in-class exam, uh, take-home test, essay, in-class exam, I'm not saying throw out the in-class exam. I'm just saying be honest and open about why you're weighting the test the way you are and be clear about who you're dis disadvantaging in each instant. I could, I could get on board with that. I then wonder, so if we tie this into deliberate practice, um, and I do want to give you a chance to, to set the record straight on a, a widely misunderstood set of ideas, um, but as I think about that, I think, okay, you, know, you take your Bill Gates argument, for example, um, one of his real advantages was that he was able to accumulate that practice faster or earlier. Um, and in turn, you know, the hope is that the people who do that then also become extremely thorough, right? And I'm wondering how you think about that. So the, the people who do rack up more practice and, and therefore more expertise are probably gonna be mostly speed people. And what yeah. do you do to, to even the score there after selection and admissions? Yeah, well, so computer programming, the li I know just a little tiny bit about that. And the little tiny bit I know suggests to me that people who are, the 90th percentile computer programmer is not just uh, better. Um, as to say, writes better code, but she is uh, faster and makes fewer errors. So there's a case where I don't think there's a neur neurotic tortoise component. Um, I think it, it appears to be that the hair is what you want, um, or at least the if you're good, you're going to be a hair. You can be a bad hair, but if you're good, you're going to be being a, being fast goes hand in hand with being accurate and creative and. Um, so that might be a different, um, uh, in fact, the more, it's funny, because I've just started digging into this thing, and the more, I'm impressed more and more with how different disciplines have, how different their kind of ideal profiles are. Um, and, uh, I mean, this is part of a kind of larger argument for us being much more accepting of difference mm -hmm. when it comes to selection for certain sorts of, of, um, of, uh, of domains. One of the things I worry about there is as we, okay, so let's say we could profile every job, which mm -hmm. there are people in the room who have been working on this very problem. Then we end up in a situation where we're really good at selecting for individual job performance, and we're terrible at selecting for the qualities that would make for a high-performing culture or a team with diverse skills and backgrounds. Mm -hmm. um, what extra layers do you want to add in then? for the second thing, for high-performing teams. And yeah, as, as we think about not just optimizing my own individual contributions, but also, yeah. you know, what's, what's, the, what's the sum of the parts? Well, why isn't, uh, why isn't it good enough to say that uh, if I have a condition that allow, a, an environment that allows individuals to maximize their potential, that will ultimately be for the best of the, let's take, a, let's take an example um, in, a, in a university faculty, such as you belong to. Um, as a writer, my principal observation about why other writers fail is that they are in too much of a hurry. I don't think you can write a good book in two years. You may just dis disagree. You have done that, I think, but you're an anomaly. Most, most of us can't write books that quickly, and we need to be a little bit more tortoisey and a little less hairish. The problem is that the world wants you to be a hare. Your publisher says, I want it now. You're under pressure to do this X, Y, and Z, you have a one-year sabbatical where you're trying to cram it in and finish, you've got a teaching load, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But in fact, <coughs> um, even something is some, one thing that almost all of the professional writers I know, so not people who have a day job like yourself, um, do, the very best of them do, is that they write drafts and then they put the, put the book in a drawer for six months and then they come back to it. They build in, they turn themselves into tortoises, force themselves to slow down and go back. Um, now does that, that in a sense harms the system in that the 
amount of output is lowered. But I don't think the problem with writing in America right now is a failure of output. I think it's a failure of quality, right? Um, so there's a case where I think the overall system could use maybe a little lower level of, of, um, of production and some higher production values. Um, and I think that having individual writers who write better books makes us all better. Now, that doesn't really answer your question because you're talking, I think, about much more coherent organizations. But is The New Yorker a better organization if writers slow down and write fewer articles in a year, but those articles are very memorable? I think if you did a, a systematic analysis of the financial health of The New Yorker, you would learn that it, it's, The New Yorker is a hit-driven enterprise that probably eight articles a year account for 90% of people's interest in the, um, in the product. And so that to the extent you can encourage people to write fewer hits, you're better off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the, the academic cheat on this is by the time you write a book, you've already been working on the topic for five or 10 years. And so a lot of the tortoise so, work happened up front, right? Yes, but the right. research part of it, yeah. um, which doesn't guarantee that the book will be sensible or um, even understandable. But I, I, do, um, I do wonder then, so give, give us a, a chance to update the thinking on, okay, so you know, 10,000 hours, probably, it might be your most widely discussed uh, bit of writing. Um, I think arguably the most misunderstood as well. What would you actually like us to conclude about expertise and deliberate practice? Uh, well, as I have explained many times, and no one here is interested in listening, I was only, I was interested in that because I was interested in the idea that if it takes you a long time to master something, longer than you would imagine, then that must mean that you need a lot of help, A, and B, that you must be in a situation that's patient. That's what interested me, was the context that if, if we're all naturals, then the context in which we perform what we do is irrelevant, right? If you're born being able to, to, uh, to be a scratch golfer, then why do we need, you know, uh, to spend money developing young golfers? It's all there, right? Um, but once you understand, actually, not only does it take a long time to get good, even if you're really incredibly talented to begin with, um, but it takes a, an incredibly long time, then you understand, oh, not even Roger Federer could be a great tennis player without a coach, without a place to go and play tennis, without parents who drive him there, without people who, remember Roger Federer, for years and years and years, was known for having a terrible te temper. And it's really interesting, you go back, sorry, get a little Roger Federer right here, but the great, at the beginning of his career, he was thought to be someone who would never amount to true greatness because he didn't have the right, pers the requisite personality. He would have these meltdowns. He would throw his racket, he would storm off the court, and they were like, ugh, another one of these people is going to squander his talent. But that's just because we were observing him in the middle of his necessary period of ten tennis apprenticeship. And he, once he had completed that, he turned into the tennis player we know, someone who is, whose control of his emotions is perhaps as good as anyone who's played the game, right? So even Roger Federer required a patient ecosystem to become truly great. That's all I was trying to get at. I, 10,000 hours, I mean, it's a number that has been thrown around by a number of people who were looking at musicians, which I just thought was intriguing. Mm -hmm. But it was never meant to be a kind of definitive. Um, and nor was it meant to be a statement that talent didn't matter. It was that talent, re talent requires a lot of time to be, um, you know, I can spend 10,000 hours of any number of things and I will never be any more than mediocre. Yeah, and I guess in turn, the role that luck and opportunity played in, in making that possible yeah, is, is a huge part of the story. So we have audience questions, uh, which I would love to, to throw some of them your way. Um, one of them is, you're, you're harsh on standardized tests because of what they're missing, and the maybe arbitrary or artificial performance standards that are missing key skills that might be relevant for a job or personality traits, for that matter. Um, what else is being rewarded that we shouldn't be measuring? Like, can you afford to take an LSAT prep class? And how do we get that out of the system? Well, a really good way to get out of the system would be to dump standardized tests entirely. Uh, you know, they're, they're, the contribution for all the fuss that this country, <coughs> when I say this country, a lot of other countries don't have standardized tests. I mean, it's not, it is not a given that human beings need to conduct their entry 
uh, to leave institutions this way. Um, I don't understand why people are so obsessed with them given the fact that their actual predictive usefulness is small. I mean, grades are a way better use. Uh, SAT scores give you a little bit of bump past grades, but there are actually all kinds of other tests that do a better job of this than the SAT. I mean, the mythology around this test, it's almost, it's not a, it, it's almost like there's a kind of fetish for these things in American society, which as an outsider I find incredibly puzzling. But sure, yeah, you, now you've got a system where people are hiring coaches at enormous costs in order to improve their score on a test that doesn't really matter all that much in the end. I mean, it, we are now at a level of absurdity with this particular game. Why don't you just call a halt to it? I'm, I'm, I'm sick, in other words, of trying to fix the system. I think it's time just to dump the system. Just to say, why this is just a, it's, it's a crazy, if we were starting from, the, the question we ought to ask ourselves is, if we were starting the American educational system from scratch tomorrow, would we have the SAT? And the answer is, of course we would. So why are we persisting in this charade? So I have, a, I have a thesis, or at least a hypothesis, which is I think we're, we're in the charade because it creates an illusion of certainty. Mm -hmm. And it allows those of us who make selection decisions to believe that there are more deserving and less deserving or more qualified and less qualified candidates, um, which I think is largely an illusion. Um, but if we throw the system out altogether, we're still going to be looking for sources of certainty. How do you tackle the more fundamental problem of people having to sit and admit that what they do every day in sorting and selecting and betting on applicants is basically throwing darts and that, you know, there's, there's basically a lottery running there, whether they like Why it or not. Why don't just run the lottery? Well, our, uh, our mutual friend Barry Schwartz suggested we should do I that. I totally agree with him. I mean, I think that's the, one of the smartest things. Have a cutoff, say that uh, if I'm a, I'm a, you know, I'm Penn, I'm interested, in order to apply for Penn, you must be in the top 10% of your class um, and you must do one interesting thing on the side. Uh, and then, uh, then we're going to throw all those names in a hat and pull them out. I mean, I can tell you with 100% certainty the freshman class of Penn under those circumstances would be infinitely more interesting than it is now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad we have no, no freshmen in the room. <laughs> uh, I guess, you know, what <laughs> that surfaces for me is a lot of things. Uh, the one that, that I want to follow up on, though, is there's still going to be some arbitrariness in where you draw the cutoff. And yeah. so the, you're, you're never going to end up at a complete lottery with what you called elite institutions. Mm -hmm. um, if you were going to design your own selection system, what would you put in it that you think is less arbitrary than the alternatives on the table today? I would, uh, I thought about this actually, that to me the, and this actually has a, a good deal of relevance for recruiting new organizations as well. Um, the conversation is too one-sided. So. <clears throat> if you read the literature on what makes for a meaningful college experience, um, almost all of that literature stresses the, the, the role of the, the way that student interacts with their institution. That is, when I show up on campus on day one, how do I behave? Do I seek out the most interesting professors to me and take their classes? Do I join, if I'm interested in music, do I join the band? Do I go out for cross country? Do I, do I willingly throw myself into the experience or do I smoke dope in my room, right? Um, that, the variable is you, not the institution. And we have somehow lost that fact. So if I'm an institution, what I'm really interested in, which ought to be in, is what does the individual want from me? So I would say, when you write a, instead of writing an essay that talks about what happened in your own life, and the institution says, oh, I like that and that and that. Flip it. The essay should be, what do I want from my college education? Who would I, if you're MIT, the cream of the cream, right? Or you're Harvard or whatever, you should say, someone who's applying to your school should be able to say with a certain degree of specificity which professor they would like to study with and why. And if, you, if you're not at that stage in intellectual development, then don't go to those schools, because that's what the schools are for, right? Go to a place where, if you want to, and if you want to join a frat and party, you should say, my int principal interest is joining a frat and partying, and as a result, I would like to go to Duke. But I mean, the point is you can, that institutions ought to have clear personalities and ought to 
recruit those people who are interested in that kind of thing, right? If I'm Carnegie Mellon and I have maybe the greatest robotics faculty in the world, what I want to know is, if you're applying to Carnegie Mellon, if you're into robotics, why? What would you do if you came here? Come and, did you come last year and sit in a robotics class and what did you think, right? How do you see yourself, you know, have you read stuff by any of the professors at Carnegie Mellon and if so, what did you think of the stuff that you read? That's relevant. What are you going to do when you get here is the question I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. Do you want companies to do the same? I do. Uh, I think they do do that to some extent. I think they do a better job of colleges at yeah. doing that. Um, it, this is one of many areas where I think the, the uh, public, where, where education can learn from the private sector. But I feel like there are situations where, um, I mean, we asked that question in a very vague way. What, how do you see yourself in five years? Which is too far in the future, I think, generally. But, um, but I think, yeah, more, to the extent we, should, we, do, we, we could do more of that, we should. If I'm an employer and I really want to take your argument seriously, mm -hmm. and I want to make sure that I'm not privileging speed over power, where do I start? An employer? Uh, well, that's interesting. I guess I would like to see, I mean, I'm, I am the millionth person to say this, um, that the ultimate um, uh, uh, version of speed versus power is not a, 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 a perfect fit here, but um, that apprenticeships or tryout, trial periods um, are a version of power over speed, right? I'm removing the time constraint on making my evaluation, and I'm saying, if you would like to come, why don't you just come and why don't we all just see how things go over a period of weeks or months? I, I've all, always, my um, brother, who was an elementary school principal and cared, for you to go and spend six months in an institution, at the end of the day, you and the institution to say, it's not, it's not working. That shouldn't be a black mark on your resume at all. That should just be, that should actually be a positive mark. It says that you should, you're brave enough to experiment, to go out in the world and try stuff. And that's actually a spirit we like here. Mm -hmm. So I like the idea of, of stretching out the time horizon for work samples. Um, it does raise the question, though, of we have good evidence that people who job hop more often tend to be less loyal, less committed, less likely to be good citizens. And so you know, if, if that's now a sign that you're willing to experiment. But this is a job, I think this is a different category than job hopping. In fact, the end goal of this kind of um, these kinds of experiments is, I would think, to, um, uh, to end job hunting. That's say, if I can do a better job of fitting you with the organization, you're less likely to leave me, not more. So it's not a sign of someone's underlying happy feet if they do three experiments in a row. It's a sign of their desire to be the opposite of someone with happy feet, to try to find a, a new home. Yeah, new home. I can see that. I like it. Um, I also, there's an interesting question here about, uh, about engineers. And you've actually written recently about how engineers think. Um, you, I did that piece because you told me, uh, you turned me on to this brilliant article from Denny, from Denny Goya. Jo Goya. Joya. Joya. I didn't realize that was my fault. Not um, your fault. <laughs> By the way, parenthetically, if you're someone who's a writer, the best, best thing you can do is just have lunch with Adam, like once every couple months, and he just, and take a pen paper, just write down everything he says. That's what I do. <laughs> I've done that on so many occasions. <laughs> it's fantastic. Anyway, go on. <laughs> Strangely, I've never had that experience. Um, but I will, I will say that you uncovered some really interesting insights about how engineers process information. And we're trying to make organizations more evidence-based. We're trying to make them more data-driven. That's what engineers do for a living. Is there anything we can learn from how engineers think as we think about sort of making HR and the world of people more data-driven? Uh, I don't know. I mean, do you, uh, what are the, the most remarkable, um, what are the most salient facts about thinking and learning about the culture of engineers? And I would say, parenthetically, I grew up in that culture since my father was a civil engineer. Um, is that if you're not an engineer, I'm not sure you want to spend a lot of time with engineers. My father accepted. Um, there, you know, it's a very, very particular culture. I don't know whether you want to make the world resemble um, 
engineering culture, I sort of think what you want to do in that case is to find better ways for these two very different cultures to speak to each other. I mean, I think we absolutely need engineers to think like engineers, but we absolutely don't want everyone to think that way. Um, and nor do we want the non-engineers to shut down the engineers. We want to sort of have both healthily at the table. Um, I worry a little bit about, um, you know, about, uh, about the hiring process becoming, I'm more worried about it becoming too dependent on analytics than I am about it not being dependent on analytics enough. I wish there was a little more humility about um, what can and can't be um, measured. Uh, you know, the, you know in, I follow this most closely in sports, and you can't follow the analytics revolution in, say, basketball, and not, and not simultaneously be thrilled at what we can know and deeply humbled about what we absolutely can't know. I mean, there was a, um, uh, and I've, I've forgotten his name, there was at the center for, there were two uh, European players playing in the Denver Nuggets earlier this year. Neither were playing very well. Um, and the consensus was that maybe they were going to be, a, they were going to, one or both of them was going to wash out. Denver traded one of them, either Nuric or the other guy, to Portland. It is now the case that both are playing unbelievably well. All that was necessary in one case was for the other guy to leave town, and in the second case was for the other guy just to go to a different team, to Portland as opposed to Denver. And all of a sudden now they're talking about him as one of the best centers in the league. Um, if you can find any analytic that helped you predict that outcome, be my guest. It was an intangible. It was, they weren't happy together, and apart, they're fantastic. Um, and that, when I look at the example of, the basketball fans in this room will know, Nuric, and who's the other guy? Yes. Um, the, the, that just tells you that there's an awful lot that we can't um, easily understand about human performance. I completely agree with that assessment. Um, I think we could probably you know, reduce our false positive and false negative rates you know, more than we currently do. Um, what I like, though, about bringing engineering discipline to the table is uh, you're not a big fan of the Myers-Briggs as one example. Um, engineers look at that and say, who made this up and why can't we do better in half a century of actual social science? And it's much easier than to update broken systems um, with, you know, with better ideas. Um, do you see more of that to come in the world of analytics? And how do we do that while maintaining humility? Uh, wow. Uh, do I see more of that? Well, I'm not in, you know, my, if you have a historical perspective on the use of analytics, you tend to be somewhat pessimistic about their intelligent use. Because it strikes me that there's just so much overwhelming um, laziness in the way we use metrics um, to, um, uh, to analyze success. Some of that laziness is being um, uh, confronted with the current generation. But, but I'm, you know, is that just a case where every new generation makes up its new, met new metric and then goes to sleep and accepts that unquestionably until next generation comes. I mean, I don't know. It's like, in other words, I'm not terribly impressed with it, with the ability of human beings to be um, uh, consistently self-critical about the value of the analytics they use to make sense of the world. I mean, we are still clinging to gross, to GDP as a useful measure of how well we're doing as a country. If you poke into that, that is bananas. I mean, it's about as lame a measure that you could possibly use to tell how well we're doing, right? So like, but yet, it's the first thing that's, that's quoted when it comes to, when we have a, when we use an analytic to assess the, 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 the how, how good our performance as a country is. It's crazy. Um, uh, so I mean, I'm not, you know, I, 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 forgive me if I'm not, if I'm not uh, optimistic about how well this will go in the future. I think it's an important sobering note, and it also levels the playing field a little bit so that it's not just lawyers and dookies who feel a little bit hurt <laughs> by commentary. Everybody has a Everyone, reason to yes. question themselves. 
Um, with that aside, Malcolm, it's, it's been a real treat to have you here. Um, there are tons of people in this room, myself included, who got into this field in large part because of your work, and we're all really grateful that you continue to do it. So we're going to head to the cocktail reception now. Thank you. Thank you.